Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are gathering here this morning to, uh, to do some work on the Pay Act for 2020. And so we will uh, be hearing from a number of witnesses from um, various parts of state government. Um, and uh, in particular, we will be spending quite a bit of time with our own Joint Fiscal and Legislative Council staff to understand the, the bill that is before us and its fiscal implications. So um, I think we would like to start with the Commissioner of um, Finance and Management. So Adam Gresham is with us and we would like to invite him to help us uh, understand the administration's perspective on this collective bargaining agreement and uh, anything else he would like to share with us. Good morning, Adam. It's nice to have you in committee. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well and um, maybe um, nice to be with you. So um, my, uh, my comments will be that uh, typically the administration, when it submits its budget uh, in January, um, does not include uh, the Pay Act as part of the budget uh, because, as the committee knows, the Pay Act is a separate bill uh, which comes out of your committee and uh, finds its way through appropriations. Uh, however, we do. Um, account for it in our uh, expenditure projections and uh, thus we always anticipate an amount uh, for the Pay Act to be either added to the appropriations bill as it has been in some years or appropriated separately. So in the uh, governor's recommended budget in January and also in the uh, revised um, core one bill uh, that we submitted uh, last week. Uh, we did not include Pay Act um, as part of our submission. However, we anticipated uh, that Pay Act would pass uh, or a, a Pay Act bill would come. Uh, subsequently, as I think the committee is aware, uh, the House Appropriations Committee added Pay Act language uh, to the Q1 and um, to uh, ensure uh, that Pay Act was accounted for in appropriations. Um, and uh, the governor um, had, does not object to that. Uh, we did not put it in our bill, but the governor um, is fine acknowledging uh, that the um, administration, as well as the legislature, intends to uh, fully commit to uh, the collective bargaining agreement and the money that that would uh, require within uh, the appropriations bill. So um, I will stop there um, and see if people have questions or uh, comments. Jim Harrison. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have a You're couple of questions. I noticed in the appropriations uh, three month bill that they include an appropriation for the Pay Act, but only year one, and I think the draft that we're looking at is an appropriation for year one and two, so fiscal 21, fiscal 22. Uh, any idea why it would be done that way? Um, uh, as uh, I said you, earlier, we did not put uh, Pay Act in our Q1 submission to House Appropriations, so I think the better people to ask on that uh, would be uh, the legislature or the joint fiscal office. Uh, however, I, I would note that the Q1 bill is uh, meant just to be, uh, to get us into uh, the new fiscal year and a full budget will be uh, debated and agreed upon and signed uh, later on in the summer. So um, the fact that one year is in there um, as opposed to two probably um, is a bow towards the fact that this is just a, um, one quarter bill and uh, the full uh, amount will be put in later in the summer. Can I just, yeah, I just want to respond to that. Uh, it's, I think that's more or less right. This is really just a placeholder. They didn't want to get ahead of your work. And so they just put in a, the appropriation as 
we had understood it for, and it will change to whatever your bill is. It was just to basically hold the place for a pay act because there is a possibility we don't know that after the House acts that the Senate may incorporate the pay act in the budget. And we just wanted to have a, a place to link it in. And they didn't want to go too far down any policy line. They just wanted to, you know, put the money in for the first year and leave it at that. So that was sort of the thinking behind only including one year. It, it was not a statement other than that, just to hold the place. Okay. Um, Commissioner, in the draft bill that we're looking at, um, if you just, uh, there, I think it's on page 19. It talks about uh, transfers. Um, the Secretary of Administration may transfer from various appropriations and various funds and the et cetera, liquor control. What does all that mean? Is that um, different appropriations or is that where this, well, no, I'm sorry, above that, there's the 15.8 million from special fund, federal and other sources. Do we have any breakdown? And what does that mean special fund? Is that state dollars? Um, it does, special funds can be state dollars. They don't have to be, but um, that would be a thing from the fish and wildlife special fund um, to, uh, you know, clean water special fund to the literally hundreds of special funds, some of which fund our employees and payroll that uh, pays for those employees who are working in the various uh, specially funded areas. Okay, um, so we don't know exactly how much of the 15.8 million is state tax dollars versus federal funds uh, we have i mean those numbers uh, department of uh, human resources has very specific numbers as to what is general fund what is special fund what is key fund um, and the like um, and we can certainly provide that breakdown for you okay um so i look back at the pay act from two years ago um that was my first experience on government gov ops uh, dealing with that bill and as I looked at fiscal 19, um, the general fund and the transportation fund appropriations was 8.5 million. The second year, it was 10.9 million. And that's before the other funds. This year, those two are 15.8 million. Any idea why such a big increase? The uh, collective bargaining agreements um, call for certain amounts of uh, additional money each year, cost of living increases typically and step increases. Um, and so the funding amounts in the pay act are meant to um, act on the uh, collective bargaining agreement we have. Um, there's also from time to time changes in number of employees um, and uh, payroll amounts will reflect that. Okay. Um, you probably better than most people in state government um, understand the budget challenges we're facing. Um, I think the latest estimate from Steve's office was 377 million decline in revenue across state government for the coming fiscal year and another 220 million the year after. Um, given that it looks like next year alone, the cost of the pay act, and again, I don't know what portion is federal, but um, is in excess of $30 million. If we cannot fund it, yes, we can put it on paper, but if that ends up being a deficit, then we have to cut elsewhere. What does that translate into state employees if um, we're not able to come up with revenue to cover that? Um. I ask, um, what are you referring to in terms of what does that mean for in state employees? Well, so, so let's Maybe just use more specific. $30 million. Okay. So if we are not able to give you $30 million more in revenue to pay for this, what, um, and obviously we're not going to have revenue growth at, 
it doesn't appear. Um, what what does that mean in terms of state positions if if the only option you have is cutting positions? Um, if the question is what does thirty million dollars translate into um, positions? Uh, just a typical rule of thumb um, that I would use would be roughly ninety to one hundred thousand dollars per position cost. That's all in payroll and benefits and the like. Uh, so that would be um, somewhere around uh, three hundred positions. Okay. Thank you. And do you have any idea where we, how we account for the revenue and just thirty million dollars? Um, it's part of our um, overall revenue picture, which includes uh, general fund revenue from various broad-based taxes um, and the like. So uh, we include that with our total revenue picture for the general fund, which is somewhere in the order of one point seven billion dollars. Okay, thank you. Rob LeClaire. Rob, you'll want to unmute yourself. Sorry, new with the iPad. Um, uh, Commissioner, the, uh, the governor's put out there that we're looking for like about a 2% reduction, I guess, by quarter um, in, in budgets going forward. Can you tell me, does that number take into consideration pay increases from the budget act, I mean, uh, the, the contract, or would that be over and above? Um, that number includes everything. Um, so that includes uh, everything that goes into um, making a budget. Uh, the governor did not um, specify that he wants um, the reductions in um, spending to um, include payroll or not. Um, he told departments and agencies as part of his submission that they should find uh, ways to deal with um, a 2% reduction represented as 23%, not 25% of their uh, full fiscal 20 um, spending. So there was not, it was not specified whether that would be um, operating expenses, payroll, programs, grants, and the like. Right, but does that 2% reduction, would that include the Pay Act amount or is that so far not including the Pay Act amount? Um, the Pay Act was not included as part of our submission. Okay, very good, thank you. You're welcome. John Gannon. Hey, John. Thank you. Hey, Adam, how are you? Uh, so it's I have fine. heard Thank from you. at least um, one group who, who felt that it, there was a 2% reduction in cost plus pay act. So that's not the guidance from the administration? Uh, the administration was a 2% reduction in general fund FY 20 first quarter or full year spending. So we looked at what a department spent over the entirety of a year um, and we took 23% of that. And we asked them to live in that within those means for the first quarter of FY21. That's how we did it. Okay. So part of the recommendation we heard from Beth Pastigi is that there would be a pay raise for exempt employees in FY22, did the administration consider not having um, pay raises for either fiscal year? Uh, as you're probably did aware, the administration, you're probably aware the administration has asked uh, exempt employees to forego uh, their uh, wage increases in FY21. Um, it has not extended yes. that to the classified employees. Right. No, I understand that. I was getting at FY22 and why there is a pay increase for exempts in, in that fiscal year. 
Uh, we have not dealt with FY22. Uh, you're aware that we're in an environment with revenues very volatile, and we're really trying to look closer near term. We realize we need to have a FY21 budget, um, certainly a first quarter budget before we leave, and by the summer, a full budget. And so we're looking shorter term until the revenue picture becomes more clear. So the, the current draft of the Pay Act includes pay raises for exempt employees in FY22. So are you saying those shouldn't be there? I'm not saying that. I'm saying we have not dealt that far in advance yet. Well, but they're in the Pay Act. Right. So in the Pay Act, traditionally they would be in the Pay Act, wouldn't they? So we haven't changed the Pay Act except for the first year of exempt employees. We've asked them to forego raises. Right, in, in a normal Pay Act year where we're not facing the, the financial crisis we are, yeah, there, there would be pay raises actually for both fiscal years. Right. But this isn't a normal time. Right, and we have looked at the first year and we reserve the right to make decisions um, about the upcoming fiscal 22 uh, either in the summer of this year or when we do the fiscal 22 budget in the fall of this year. Okay. Now, you're fully supportive of the collective bargaining agreements um, that were signed by the executive branch with VSEA, VSEA? We support the agreements that were signed. Okay. Thank you. Marcia Gardner. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, do you know what the average pay for all exempt employees is? Um, that would be a better question for my colleague, the Commissioner of uh, Human Resources, Beth Festigi. I don't know offhand. Thank you. Beth or Hi. either of your numbers, guys? I um, actually missed the question. I'm sorry. That's Could you repeat that? Yes. Thank you. Do you know what the average pay for all exempt employees is? All, oh, hmm. So all of the commissioners and- the I do not have that at my fingertips. I don't, I don't know that Harold Schwartz will have that as a fingertips either. We can certainly get that. I have the average of pay, I think for all employees combined and then probably just for the classified, I can get that from the workforce report, but I'm unsure if, Average pay for exempt employees is in there, so we we'll have to get that. Um, Harold, I have those numbers. Thank you. Yep. Harold, you muted yourself. Do you have uh, Do you have a calculation? Um, I don't have the calculation right now, but I'm checking the workforce report to see if we've got it in there for uh, last fiscal year. Um, uh, last fiscal year. Uh, the average was, um, let me take a look. Um, well, give me a couple of minutes. Um, no, the average was 85,236. Uh, 85, for exempt employees. For exempt employees. Okay, thank you. That's executive branch. Um, can I follow with another question? Absolutely. Do you know what the average is for classified employees? Uh, for the same period, which was last year, it was 62,440. Thank you. Executive branch. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your quick work on that, Harold. Uh, Jim Harrison has a question. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is for uh, Adam or for Beth, but um, given the um, huge uncertainty in revenue for the coming fiscal year and the year after, has any consideration been done with by the administration to consider asking the union to delay implementation and vote until August when we have a hopefully a better picture of whether we're getting federal help or um, the revenue forecasts are firmed up a little bit? Um, don't don't all jump want to take one. that. I'm happy to answer that. <laughs> Go ahead, Adam. Um, we have not had that discussion um, within the administration or with the uh, union. 
Okay, so given um, understanding that, um, I might be something you want to consider. Uh, given that there, the way this is structured this year, um, with the fourteen hundred dollar per employee um, lump sum payment for cost of living, um, if my understanding is under the current terms, if we pass this, this is paid on July first, give or take. What happens? That's correct. Um, what happens if an employee leaves on July second after they receive that? Um, I, they receive their payment. Okay, so it's just uh, an all, something, well, it may be too late now, but um, normally if you gave, if that was the equivalent of 2.2% or whatever the number is, that would have been spread out over the year and you would have gotten paid for the weeks you work, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Maybe this is a question for um, Beth, but um, percentage-wise, the fourteen hundred dollars plus the average step increase. Uh, am I correct in assuming that the classified employees will be receiving four point one percent on average? Understanding some will get more than that, and some will get less depending on the step increases. Yeah, that uh, th that's that's correct. Um, the I would say that the difference is that. It's not um, what the, um, the lump sum makes it so that is not built into their base salary. So the only part that would be built into the base salary is the step. So the step where um, employees who are um, going to get a step that year, that step is typically um, you know, in the three to 4% range of their salary. And then employees that are not gonna get a step that year, they may get, be getting a step every other year or every third year those employees would have um, uh, really a 0% increase in salary. And then the way this contract is stated, then in year two, they would get that 2.25%. And I did yeah. want to actually step back um, when you were asking about the difference in pay act costs from the last pay act to this pay act, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. The, um, the across the board increase for that was instead of typically it comes in July, it came in January. So it really amounted to only an increase for half of the fiscal year, um, for fiscal year uh, 2019. Uh, so that was where you saw, saw some savings there. And also the amount, the 1.35% is certainly lower than the 2.25% that we negotiated this time. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, and no, no, that, that's helpful. And I, I understand you know, last winter when this was negotiated was a different environment. Uh, we were fortunate that revenues were actually increasing. We were beating projections. Um, and I, I don't fault anybody for the outcome. It just strikes me, quite frankly, given the an excess of 20% unemployment, a number that has not been seen since the Great Depression in hundreds, if not thousands of businesses potentially closing uh, that aren't gonna weather this summer, this spring and summer, um, with or without economic help um, that, um, and I think the administration, you know, at least started the conversation with um, postponing any increases for exempt uh, positions and some of the other constitutional offers have done the same for their shops. Um, I just, we're asking people on unemployment to pay more taxes if that's how we have to fund this at the end of the day. Uh, and I, I am very worried about that uh, scenario. Um, so um, I would encourage you to consider uh, a request to the union to postpone um, this discussion until August uh, when we all have a better picture and hopefully we have a better uh, understanding of what we may be able to get for help from Washington, et cetera. Uh, and if it 
looks good. We can make it retroactive to July 1 and keep everybody whole <clears throat> as per the agreement. But I, I am very concerned about that. And furthermore, if I may, I'd like to follow up on Representative Gannon's question. Um, would the administration consider um, removing the exempt and elected position increases for year two uh, of the Pay Act? And if things are good next year, we can do a new Pay Act to uh, reinstate them. For the, uh, I, I just kind of go from back to front, I guess. So for the elected officials, um, I wouldn't, I think that we don't generally make the recommendation on that. The legislature makes the recommendation on that. And it's typically been based on the agreements in the union contract. Um, we didn't recommend backing out um, the exempt increases in fiscal year um, 2022. Um, basically, we haven't even considered that. Um, the legislature authorizes them, but the increases um, and whether or not exempt employees under the governor's purview get the increases is really based on um, the governor's and the secretary of administration's recommendations. So as we got closer to um, determining what raises and how we would do raises for fiscal year 22, or if we were to do raises, we would take um, that the, the financial situation into account at that time and make the determination at that time. So just because the legislature authorizes us to make the increases, um, unless we are statutor statutorily or contractually obligated to uh, make those pay, re pay increases, we would take that very seriously, just like we have now and recommended no increases for this current fiscal year. Thank you. Um, and one final question for you. Um, from your perspective, what would happen if we opted to do a one-year pay act and postpone discussion of funding of year two of the pay act until um, next session? Let's say that that's that's within your purview. Um, our um, we would want to. Um, Make sure that we are able to cover our fisc our contractually obligated fiscal year costs for this fiscal year. So, um, if the, however the legislature wants to do that and authorize that, um, I don't think that we would have any issue with. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if there's any other, you know, legal in implication to that. If there is, um, you know, John. Berard, our labor relations director, is very familiar with this Labor Relations Act, and I don't know if there's any other um, issue with that. Is there, John, that you're aware of? We would arguably have to go back to the bargaining table and bargain some sort of uh, second year freeze or wa wage reopener provision to because the money would not have been appropriated at that point in time by the effective date of the agreements. So we'd have to go back to the bargaining table. Okay, so even though there could be a expectation that the money would be appropriated next year for the following year, uh, that would um, upset the terms of the contract that you signed? Yes, because the money would not be appropriated. So there's no guarantee that the money would be there to fund the second year. We'd have to go back to the table and build in some sort of contingency for that. Okay, um, thank you. I, I, I guess, you know, I'm a, a novice on some of the uh, ins and outs of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, you know, I, I was reading, you know, New York State, the governor unilaterally uses emergency powers to freeze, um, I think, a scheduled 2% pay increase to state employees, uh, 80,000 employees. Um, Pennsylvania governor froze pay. Um, so evidently, they have different um, powers that we don't have unless the governor has some that I'm just not aware of. Thank you. 
So I have a couple other committee members who have questions, but uh, but I wanted to jump in and ask Adam a question uh, before I go to other committee members. Uh, so Adam, you've been around this track a few times. Uh, you know that we are heading for the home stretch, and now is the time that these decisions need to be made. Um, and a couple of your responses have been sort of tepid as far as the commitment of the administration to uphold this collective bargaining agreement. Um, I just want to get a real clear answer from you. Um, do you intend to, uh, to fully fund this collective bargaining agreement for the two-year pay act? And, um, and if not, uh, now is the time to let us know that you intend to go back to the bargaining table. Um, I would point out, I think it's the legislature that funds the pay act, not the administration, um, but the, the, the collective bargaining agreement, right? But the administration, um, has entered into a collective bargaining agreement. We, our signature is on the dotted line and we intend to fulfill it. Thank you. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam chair. Uh, this is a, a comment for you, Commissioner, and uh, thanks for, for being here and enlightening us. Um, and even though Representative Harrison stole some of my thunder, the comment I wanna share is given that we're in this very volatile um, financial crisis, um, I think it might be very prudent for the administration to have a plan B and even a plan C in place because we just don't know how things are gonna play out. And um, that's what I want to share. Thank you. Right. Um, and understood. I mean, one reason that the administration and the legislature has decided on um, a quarter one bill as opposed to a full fiscal 21 budget um, is to give us some time to think about it and come up with a plan B and a plan C if necessary. Uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to have any certainty um, with uh, the length of the crisis or indeed the uh, revenue impact of that crisis. So we are um, keeping the lights burning uh, for the first quarter. We're continuing as we were uh, for three months, and then we will have a full discussion with all options on the table this summer. Um, so I, I take your comment to heart, and that, that is what we uh, intend to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to, to add my, I don't have a question right now. I just have a statement that I, um, I, I appreciate um, what Adam just shared. And, and I agree. I think to try and push the envelope right now to open up renegotiations at this point in time is really putting the, the, the cart in front of the horse. And if this is the sense of the committee, then maybe we should take a straw poll as to whether we want to do that now. But I don't agree with that. And, and the idea that we're, we're trying to push things in this direction um, to open up an agreement and, and change things right now, as, as Adam just said, we're here right now to create a, a quarter one budget and, and to take the time if, if we need further plans, as Hal said, a plan A, plan B, and maybe plan C. At this point in time, we're working on quarter one and uh, I'm not ready to push that and abrogate agreements that have already been made. Um, so I, I have a question maybe for Adam, I'm not sure. Um, have any state workers during COVID been um, been released or put on leave or um, or uh, told told that their job wasn't essential? Um, so we have not have we haven't had rifts or furloughs. If that answers your question, um, there have certainly been people at various times that have not been that have not had to come to work, but we've paid them. 
based on, you know, if they if they had a job that required them to be just with a stay home, stay safe order, if their job required them to be do their work on site and they couldn't come on site, we paid them to stay home. And presumably somebody else had to pick up the slack. No, like for example, when um, the, the stay home, stay safe order came home and everyone had to stay home for two weeks and a lot of industry was shut down, for example, um, construction was shut down. So we weren't doing construction. Our employees that are kind of generally doing construction and maintenance on roads, they might not have been coming into work, maybe just a skeleton crew, but the full crew, because we were not doing the road maintenance at that time, wouldn't have come into work. Thank you. Um, committee, any other questions for either Adam or Beth while we have them both on the hot seat? All right, please stick with us uh, because I think what I'd like to do now is ask uh, either Steve Klein or Stephanie Barrett if they can uh, help us with a breakdown of uh, the numbers in the PAY Act. And then, of course, when the camera's off, you don't know whether they've wandered away. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I would suggest that um, Stephanie do the breakdown of the numbers. Um, she's been working on that more. So I, um, the, the numbers that were in the section that are in the quarter one bill were estimates that we put in yes, or yesterday or the day before based on the original amounts, um, less a sort of an estimated amount of how much the general fund would go down with the exempt piece, we just received updated numbers from Harold for the executive branch. Um, we're slightly different in the judicial branch and the um, uh, legislative branch than Harold's numbers. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering which, would you like to walk through, do you want Harold to walk through his exec, executive branch numbers for FY21 and 22 and have us walk through judiciary and legislative branch? I'm trying to figure out what the best approach is here. Uh, I the think that, that makes sense to uh, to ask Harold if he's got those numbers uh, to present for us, and then we'll come back to you for judiciary and legislative branch numbers. Thank you. Okay. Harold, do you have uh, do you have a document you'd like to get up on our committee page? Is it already there? Then I just haven't seen it yet. Um, Madam Chair, uh, hello, it's Betsy Ann. Just, just to clarify, uh, the draft 2.2 that's now posted, um, the numbers will appear different than what Harold will be presenting, but I can send over to Andrea some updated numbers if you'd like, or else Harold can just point out where his figures differ than those set forth in draft 2.2, which is currently posted. Okay. Um, Harold, are you with us? All right, well, let's go back to Stephanie um, and uh, let's talk about the legislative and judicial branch numbers and maybe Harold has stepped away from his device for a moment and will be back with us. Beth, I don't know if you have a direct line to him and can poke him to to come back because he we would like to get him up. Oh, uh, sorry, I was uh, sorry, I was unfortunately muted. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time looking at the 2.2, but I've got the numbers uh, that I came up with that I've sent recently to Betsy Ann, and I can walk through those numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, th this is the uh, the appropriation numbers. For executive branch, um, general fund, eleven million two hundred and thirty-four thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. Transportation fund, three million eight hundred and sixty-eight thousand four hundred and fifty-one dollars. Other, twelve million eight hundred and nine thousand four hundred and forty dollars. So the other is the combination of federal and special funds. Is that? Yes. Okay. Questions from committee members? 
Want that? All right, nobody's diving at their screen to put their hand up. So um, Stephanie, can you help us understand the judiciary and legislative branch numbers? So the, the, um, the judicial branch numbers, uh, Pat Gable earlier in the week sent us an analysis based on, on um, you know, if there was uh, across the board, the full piece, but um, in a scenario B, which is without the, um, the judicial officers and no increase for exempts in the judicial branch. And that number is the $872,330,000 number that was, included in the in the the quarter one bill judicial branch estimate for FY21. The second year estimate, um, FY22 estimate from the judicial branch is 1.258 um, million seven hundred and fifty nine dollars um, based on the 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 collective bargaining units and application to the judicial officers and exempts in FY22. So those are your, it, it, it's only general fund in the judicial branch and the uh, legislative branch. There's no other source of funds for those two branches. Yeah. Um, in the uh, legislative branch, Dan Dickerson in our office um, runs through the entire, all the staff sections um, and includes the legislative um, so for FY21, the estimate is $241,000 um, for increases. Um, that does exclude the exempts at the top, the chief fiscal officer and the chief ledge counsel uh, as an exempt um, and from an increase. And then in the second year, uh, with the legislative uh, expectation that it would um, the change would uh, include the step and COLA increase for legislators. That estimate was three hundred and ninety-seven thousand um, dollars for FY twenty-two in the legislative branch. Um, we see in Harold's analysis that there's a, a significant difference in FY twenty-two estimate in the legislative branch. And offline, we'll have a conversation just to understand what that difference is. Um, but it's significant. So he, he's much higher in in, in um, the FY22, but I think it's just an interpretation of, of the legislative uh, change, perhaps. So Stephanie or Steve, I'm not sure which of you would be best to enlighten the committee or remind the committee about this, um, but we've been doing a bit of work um, with consultants from NCSL on uh, our pay rates across the legislative branch, um, understanding how our uh, how our pay for for fiscal staff and attorneys um, uh, compares to other similar jobs in the industry, uh, and and how our staffing rates compare to other states of similar sizes. So, um, Steve, can you can you just fill the committee in on uh, sort of a top line message that we got from that study? Yeah, um, the, the study which was done, uh, I think a year ago, um, uh, did look at legislative pay and uh, compared to executive branch personnel and private sector personnel in other states. And um, there have been a fair amount of adjustments made to the pay that is being in place this year from that. Um, so. Most of that, I, I think, is incorporated at this time. There's a lot of changes that are planned for next year as far as management of salaries, like the Joint Legislative Management Committee is going to oversee this um, personnel benefits and issues like this more than right now. It's a lot of independent agencies, independent legislative entities doing it. Um, we, When we did the Pay Act the assumption, we did not build into it any sort of um, increases beyond where they are now, other than the, the um, salary increases that were reflected in the Pay Act. One of the big issues that you're raising, though, is all legislative employees, like all judicial employees, are exempts in technically. And so what we tend to do, if, if you look at the uh, executive branch, the um, uh, there's a total number of employees of about, um, and I don't know if I have my numbers totally right, but they're uh, in the neighborhood of 8,000. And um, 
the classified are 7,600 and the exempts are about 400, which is about 5% uh, exempts. And in judiciary, once you take the, the judges out, um, they are considered exempt and we're giving them no raise in this bill. Um, the, the ones that are going to be technically exempt from their point is about seven of their total um, uh, employees. A lot of them are confidential, personal, and things like that. So it comes to about a 2% a of their total employees. So what we're trying to do is one of the things that came up in that study is a lot of our staff, both in the uh, ledge councils or in fiscal everywhere, is really tied to classified types of people. I mean, a lot of our pay is um, compared to a senior economist in the executive branch versus an economist here or a staff person. And so they're all classified. Um, so we've been, one of the things we're trying to figure out, and we didn't really, at this point, I think as Stephanie pointed out, it involves a no pay increase for the top leadership, which is myself and Luke. They're, they may go deeper. We haven't really judged that yet. That's sort of a, we built the numbers now, but we totally understand that that's something the legislative leaders haven't figured out. And every person they decide to not give a pay increase to in this year, it's about a $3,000 or $3,300 reduction. So it could go down to the level that going down the 20,000 or so the difference between the two numbers may just be seven more people that, that uh, the administration assumed wouldn't get a raise. And I don't know where that'll end up. It's sort of a, if you use the executive branch number, it could be in the neighborhood of, depending on how you count, three to 12 people. Um, in the legislative branch, it might be two, you know, so it's, or it's just part of that's up to the leadership and, and maybe the JLMC as they work it out. So we just, we just built in what we, after talking to the speaker, sort of a, the first cut position. Thank you. Committee, any questions on that line of testimony? Jim Harrison. Yeah, I just want to go back to the numbers in general. Maybe this is for Stephanie, but the numbers that Harold gave us are different than what Betsy Ann has in the draft. Not significant, maybe, but I'm just, what are the right numbers? I would say the executive, the executive branch numbers, I would use Harold's numbers, newest updated numbers. Um, okay. For the other two branches, I would use the numbers that those branches are calculating. Okay, thank you. And that will be part of the task and make sure that we've got the right numbers. Harold, anything that you want to add to that? Um, uh, yeah, I will defer to uh, Stephanie on the judicial branch numbers, the legislative branch numbers. Um, my number is considerably higher in FY22 if you include the increase in legislator pay um, in the legislative branch because uh, unless the statutory language has changed, I haven't looked at 2.2, there's a considerable increase for legislators in FY22. And that's why my number is considerably higher. We can, I can talk to uh, Stephanie offline on that. Yeah, and we built, we think we think he may have a slight error in the way the statute is read, but we should definitely have an offline discussion. I think we, we incorporated the legislative increase also. And so it's, uh, part of it is the statute reads a lower legislative pay number, about 580 or something. In reality, legislators are getting paid 743 because the statute increases over time what, what legislators have been paid. So if you take it from their current salary, which is the way the draft reads is, Legislators are level funded okay. this year and next year. There's no increase at all. And if you use that plus 4.15%, I think you get a lower number. But we'll work that out. With, we'll let Harold know why we. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to discuss. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? All right, before we go to Betsy Ann for uh, a deeper dive into the language, um, we have Annie Noonan with us. And I, Annie, I just wanted to make sure that we gave you an opportunity to, uh, to share any other documents or thoughts that you haven't yet had a chance to go through with the committee. Great, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, committee members and other staff that are on. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I, I sent over an estimate um, for the FY21, I just wanted to give a little clarity to that. So that includes our 
that estimate included our bar our new bargaining unit employees, which are basically um, our deputy state's attorneys, administrative support staff, and um, that uh, that's our our bargaining unit. It has the victim advocates, but those are charged to federal money, so that's not included in this pay act. We charge uh, the Center for Crime Victim Services for those salaries. Um, but also as part of the 21 uh, Pay Act numbers, we would have to include our 26 transport deputies, uh, state transport deputies, and about four other non-exempt folks that work for the department, such as IT staff and central office. Um, so the people, again, who are not getting pay raises for our department are the state's attorneys, the sheriffs, the executive director, and any exempt employees. Um, we also have some other positions that are charged to federal money, and those are domestic violence prosecutors. We have 3.5 positions funded by federal US DOJ um, who handle domestic violence and sexual assault prosecutions in the offices. And we have two staff that uh, are funded by the Governor Highway Safety Program, which is part of the National Institute for Highway Safety. And those folks, those two prosecutors deal with um, uh, uh, DUI um, uh, issues, particularly um, serious injury fatality cases. So they're also not charged for this, except for a 20% match that we have to do of their salary. But for the most part, they are paid for by federal dollars. Uh, we have four current vacancies among our prosecutors, our deputy state's attorney prosecutors, um, and we are looking, um, uh, we are asking for those to be filled. So we, we did budget for those in our roll-up of the Advantage roll-up back in the fall, and we are hoping that we will get approval from the Secretary of Administration to fill those because I think, as you know, um, our, our caseloads are, are very, very high in mostly all of our offices. And we've lost two positions, uh, prosecutor positions. One is the loss of some federal dollars and one that we had to give up in meeting our FY21 governor's recommend numbers. Um, looking ahead, and I don't think you necessarily wanna talk about 22, um, but we, you know, again, following the, the executive branch contract for both in both 21 and 22. So in 21, the $1,400 plus steps, um, and then in 22, the 2.25 plus steps. The one piece, and this was asked the other day when I was listening to um, the testimony, someone, one of the committee members asked, why would there be additional costs? Why would the first year of this contract cost more potentially than the second year? And the answer to that is that there were benefits uh, agreed to through the collective bargaining agreement that were not budgeted for because we were not done negotiations. We were. We, uh, we didn't start negotiations until January 29th of this year. So some of those new benefits are not budgeted for 21. They, that number, um, that additional number, which is about um, in the, uh, about 163,000, um, we should be able to then institutionalize for our FY22 budget and would not be part of a pay act appropriation. So it kind of, it just shifts. It goes into the base budget but not in the pay act. So in the, in the subsequent year. Um, so um, the kinds of things like uh, that, if you're wondering like what would those types of extra benefits be that were not able to be budgeted would be things like um, we had to switch to a different long-term disability program. And we have to have the costs for that because we um, as bargaining unit, um, coverage extended to our employees. They are not eligible to stay in the, in the state's exempt plan. So we had to uh, look at the costs of that. Uh, after hours call increasing, uh, annual leave payout, and some overtime um, budgeting that we, um, that we have not previously um, had to experience. Um, the other uh, the other thing I think that um, I'll just raise this with the committee is, you know, certainly um, we're giving you numbers uh, for 21 that don't necessarily, that can't, aren't yet reflective of any potential retirement increase numbers that we haven't heard from retirement divisions. So those, those numbers might skew at some point later, aren't the, each department's need for additional funding, but we don't know what that increase would be. Um, and just two other points. Uh, the question was about people working. Our staff has been working uh, during this entire um, stay home, stay, stay safe process. 
Um, most of our deputy state's attorneys have been rotating in because, as you know, the courts haven't been able to completely shut down or to completely telecommute. Um, so, for example, there have been arraignments, in-court in arraignments. They would be things like um, uh, emergency cases with juveniles or homicide arraignments or things like that. So we have had our, our deputy state's attorneys in and out of the offices on a rotating basis. Um, admin staff obviously being there to prepare um, uh, packets that needed to be handed to the defense and defendant. Um, so we have had our staff. The other staff um, have been very grateful, have time to write um, uh, briefs that were due in cases and motions and things like that. So our deputy state's attorneys and our admin staff have been working uh, on data entry um, uh, work that is always something you put to the side when you really need to uh, deal with a crisis standing at your desk. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for them to do catch up and uh, hopefully create some better data for us. The other point I want to make um, that I think that uh, other uh, Commissioner Fastigi and uh, Commissioner Gresham have made is the whole question about um, what would happen if this is if the Pay Act is not funded and the insufficient appropriation language that's incorporated into each of the contracts uh, basically does require us to go back to the bargaining table um, uh, if if the Pay Act is is uh, not not um, fully appropriated to the extent that we can't meet an obligation we have agreed to in the contract. Um, so. I will stop and see if there's any questions. And otherwise, I'm going to, I will be working with um, sending as much data as I can over to, to um, Stephanie and Steve Klein for, and Betsy or whomever's working on putting together the actual real numbers for your pay act. I think um, the numbers I've given you are, are uh, good. Um, although I'm just running one or two additional questions as you always reach. I don't know about you, but I always recheck my math 20 times. So, um, I think those are relatively good numbers, Madam Chair, but hopefully um, hopefully, I, I'll be working with them to make sure that we are included in the, in the Pay Act um, appropriation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your, uh, your desire to double and triple check your math. Um, always appreciated. Um, so I think John Gannon has a question. So um, thank you for testifying, Annie. Just a quick question. I, I see that the sheriffs are getting a pay increase um, in January of 20. Oh, it, no, sorry. Skip that. I have another question, which is, why does the county sheriff get more than the other sheriffs? And I mean, then you look at the, the state's attorneys, and all the state's attorneys are paid the same except for Essex County and Grand Isle. So apparently, so so apparently, years and years ago, there was some um, some provision that came to the legislature, some request that came, and it was actually for the Chittenden County State's Attorney, the Chittenden County Sheriff. They both get higher rates than their counterparts. Um, I don't know what uh, what was said to to um, facilitate that or that led to that, but that has been uh, longstanding. And the two state's attorneys who receive less money are part-time state's attorneys, Essex County and Grand Isle County. They are, um, they're, they're requ only required to do half time. I think they do more than that, um, certainly, but um, they are considered part-time offices. For example, their administrative staff are only four days a week. And I think that maybe, um, um, may, uh, and I think that, maybe one of those offices actually uh, does close one day a week. But I don't know the history of that representative again, and I just know it's been in, in play for a lot of years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, any other questions for Annie before we switch gears yet again? All right, I don't see anybody diving at their computer screen. So that's Thank you all. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Okay, so now is the time we get to put Betsy Ann in the hot seat and she can run us through um, the bill language. I believe we have a draft 2.4, which means you have been working steadily to refine and improve um, the drafts even as we've been meeting. So thank you. Go ahead, Betsy Ann. 
Thank you. And thank you to Andrea for posting in for all the support I've been getting from JFO and DHR and Department of Finance and Management on these numbers. I have updated the numbers at the end with the feedback I've received from uh, Harold and John and JFO. So I appreciate all that. Um, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. This bill draft is set up as a committee bill from House GovOps. Um, the introduction just uh, gives a high level overview uh, to summarize what this pay act would do. This would fully fund all of the collective bargaining agreements for fiscal years 21 and 22. It would authorize compensation increases for exempt employees in the executive branch, but that's only for FY 22. Um, then it gets into adjusting the statutory salaries. Um, and again, those cover the uh, judicial branch, executive branch, and our county elected officers. And those would be only for, for FY22. Um, and then it provides appropriations to fund these increases. Also, uh, it's actually not specified in the uh, statement of purpose, but you'll see in sections 11 and 12, we'll also get into the statutory amendments for the legislative pay statutes so that legislators would be put on equal footing with the other constitutional officers in the pay increases that they get. Um, because to summarize, um, in normal pay act years, or in normal fiscal times, the other constitutional officers are able to get the same increases as set forth in the CBA. And so that is not only the COLA or AKA across the board increase, but it's also the step equivalent and legislators by statute are not entitled to get that step equivalent. Um, and because of the um, current terms of your statute in the CBA, legislators are not entitled to get a pay raise in FY21 because there is no COLA, just to remind there. But getting into the actual text of the Pay Act, we start out with section one, and this is just an explanation. It's an easy reference for all legislators to see that this act would fully fund all of our collective bargaining agreements between the state and the VSEA and the separate one um, between the state and the Vermont Troopers Association for the two fiscal years, starting July 1, 2020 through June 30, 2022. So that includes our executive branch, the judicial branch, and also the uh, state's attorney's offices. Their employees, I uh, thank you to John Berard, uh, providing me with helpful information that those state's attorney's offices are not technically executive branch employees, but are more municipal officers. But regardless, this pay act would fully fund all of the collective bargaining agreements for both fiscal years. And on page 22, or page two, you'll see the description of what all of those collective bargaining agreements or CBAs provide. In fiscal year 21, it's the average 1.9% step increase in the $1,400 one-time payment to employees employed as of July 1, 2020. And then in fiscal year 22, it's an average 1.9 step increase and 2.25% across the board increase for a total of 4.15 increase. Section two permits exempt employees in the executive branch to receive salary increases not to exceed 4.15%, but only in fiscal year 22, um, beginning on the first pay period, which is July 4th, 2021. And again, that's because the recommendation from the executive branch is to only give exempts in the executive branch an increase in FY22. Um, there in section 2B, it's just an explanation that that permitted increase in FY22 is consistent with the CBAs for classified employees um, in the executive branch, but only for FY22. So then we get to section three at the top of page three. And this section is essentially a definition section. Um, there's two provisions of law set forth in 32 VSA 1003B and 1020B, which use this phrase, the total rate of adjustment 
available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement. And that language is saying that the employees that are subject to those increases, which are executive branch um, agency and department heads, deputies and executive assistants, are able to get annual salary adjustments or special salary increases or bonuses consistent with, quote, the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement. So every pay act defines what that term actually means. And so it's defining here that in FY22 only, it means that 4.15% to be able to give those exempts who have language in statute about what a pay increase they can get. It's defining what that pay increase is and it's to be consistent with the FY22 CBA, that 4.15% increase. So Betsy Ann, yeah. um, if uh, just following along with some of the line of questioning from earlier in committee, if, if we moved forward with this language um, and when we came back into session in January, um, we, for instance, had you know had not seen additional revenue support from uh, federal COVID relief money. Um, could we change this uh, so that when we're considering the FY22 budget, we were, for instance, not offering a pay increase to um, to the uh, executive branch um, exempt employees. Yes, I think you could go back and change it. I mean, the General Assembly controls this pay um, for exempts. It's not subject to any sort of contract, but maybe if you are feeling that that might be something that you would pursue, perhaps some additional session law language just to say something along the lines of that the General Assembly reserves the ability to um, revise these increases as necessary, um, dependent on the fiscal um, situation in FY22. Just perhaps that would be helpful for people to understand that um, while, so they don't expect 100% that they're gonna get these increases. That might just be helpful for people to read that in text. So since you are the, uh, the master at um, statutory language and, and, uh, and we are citizen legislators, could you help us uh, envision what that might look like? Uh, something that was akin to a, uh, you know, a, harder, a harder knock to say, come back and look at this. You know, remember, this is, uh, this is something that we set in motion that we may want to uh, reconsider after we have more uh, understanding of the fiscal landscape. Yeah, I could definitely come back with just a, a session law section to reflect that, that these increases for exempts um, for the employees that are not subject to the collective bargaining agreements are subject to further amendment by the General Assembly dependent on um, upcoming financial, financial situation of the state. I can come back with language um, for you to add to that. Thank you, I appreciate that. I've seen a couple other nodding heads on that question. Uh, Jim Harrison has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Betsy Ann, along those same lines, um, can the General Assembly, if, you know, worst case scenarios come to be, can we cut the funding of the Pay Act next year or later this year? I, I think you're going to run into for the for the employees that are subject to the collective bargaining agreement. Yes. I mean, I think then you're going to run into those contractual issues. At a minimum, it's it's going to mean that they they'll need to go back and renegotiate based on the amount that's actually appropriated to fund their collective bargaining agreement. So if, well, yeah, I I, I get that, but if next year the revenue picture hasn't improved. We didn't get any federal help. And the reality was we could not afford the 30 or 35 million that was allocated in this bill. Can we revisit that issue next year? Understanding it would force the contract to be redone. 
I think that you could. I, I don't know what exactly that would mean for the collective bargaining agreement with, you know, if you were to enact this with fully funding the collective bargaining agreements and there was that expectation under the contract, but then to go back and reduce the appropriations to support the contract, I feel at a minimum it's going to cause issues with the contract. Aside from renegotiation, I, I don't know how the um, DHR or D Department of Finance and Management would view that proposal. Maybe they could help um, if they could weigh in on what that would mean for them. Probably yeah. be good to hear directly from them. Okay, no, thank you. I'm just looking for options. We, none of us have ever experienced this. Hopefully we never experience this again in our lifetime, but um, these are very, very uncertain times. Thank you. I'm seeing the commissioner. Should she, Madam yeah. Chair, what, what do you want? What would you like to do? I would love to ask uh, either Beth or Adam to uh, to jump in on that. Yeah, if the appropriation was changed midstream, it would send us back to the bargaining table to negotiate to whatever had been, um, whatever a change would have been made, um, of course, and then also. Um, we wouldn't really have any mechanism for clawing back money if it's already been spent. <laughs> so I can't, but so, we've already paid somebody something, I can't take it back. Absolutely. Adam, anything you wanna to add to that? You're muted. I have no additional comments to that other than um, we can't reach back into someone's bank account and take money we've already paid out. Um, That's bad form. Not that we would want <laughs> um, but um, we certainly would be beholden to what the legislature decides in that regard. So Adam, you, um, when you were testifying at the beginning of this committee session, you, you said something to the effect of um, because you didn't, because the collective bargaining agreement wasn't completed when you presented your January budget, you, you anticipated um, how you would incorporate the pay increases into your budget. Um, when the administration comes back to the legislature in whenever late July, August uh, timeframe to do the remainder of the FY21 budget, um, you will be presenting, I assume, a budget that, uh, that does incorporate the um, honoring of the collective bargaining, bargaining agreement. Is that correct? Um, mostly correct. I think the um, budget, this this is testing my memory, but I believe the budget ended in January had a set aside for the collective bargaining agreement because I believe at that point it had been negotiated. Um, in the year before or in past years, the uh, CBA, I believe the year before, the two years before, the CBA was not completed. So we did not include it in our um, budget. But I think this year we did set aside money. It wasn't a line item, um, but we had money set aside in our uh, expenditure uh, projections that would have paid for that collective bargaining agreement. We didn't put it in the budget because the Pay Act itself had not been negotiated um, and the Pay Act itself had not uh, passed. But Typically, uh, most years we know the, the bargaining agreement will cost, and we account for that in our revenue projections and expenditure projections. This summer, um, we will um, put in our uh, in the full Q1 budget um, what the Pay Act calls for. And for quarters two through four, when we come back to consider the rest of the years. Spending. Right. I mean, it, this summer um, we're anticipating to do a four quarter full year budget and we will put in there uh, what is called for in the Pay Act. Okay. Thank you. Jim, any other questions? All right. I'm guessing that's a no. All right. Beth, Betsy Ann, back to you. All right. Let's just revisit that section three at the top of page three. Remember, this is defining what that phrase total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement means in two statutes, 32 VSA 1003B and 1020B. 
Well, section four actually shows that first one, the 32 VSA 1020. Um, so you'll see where that phrase is used. But the first thing that's going on here in subsection A, I've just drafted as a technical correction. Just to look at the structure of this statute, you can see how current law reads, compensation to be paid any officer or employee within the executive branch of state government other than an employee in the classified service, a member of the uniform state police within DPS or any or an officer employee whose compensation is specifically fixed by statute. And it goes on to say, shall be determined at the time the officer or employee is hired by the governor or such person as the governor shall designate subject to any applicable statutory limits. Well, that's just not how we set up statute. We don't usually let a sentence trail on through subdivisions. So subsection A is merely a technical correction to move up that language that's currently on 19 through 21 that's struck, just moving it up verbatim the lines 12 to 14 to have it conform to our normal statutory structure. So thank you for humoring me on helping us clean up our statutes there. Um, but then you'll actually see on page four, the uh, subsection B, where that phrase is used, total rate of adjustment. So this statute is specifically in regard to, uh, here in subsection B, it's in regard to exempt employees who are deputies or executive assistants to department heads or are deputies or executive assistants to agency secretaries. And this language is saying annually, subject to any applicable statutory salary limits, the governor may grant to these employees um, salary adjustments that are not to exceed the average of the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement then in effect. The first thing that's going here on here on page four, line five, is just uh, what Harold and I believe is a technical correction. Um, Harold has requested in another section that that language average of the be removed because it doesn't make sense from um, his fiscal reading. Really, we're just talking about what is the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement. That term is defined in section three to mean 4.15% in FY22 only. So this is saying that these um, deputies or executive assistants are able to get an annual salary adjustment not to exceed 4.15% in FY22. So that's their standard salary adjustment, but you can see the statute, just to point out, does go on to say, in addition to that annual salary adjustment, the governor is able to grant a special salary increase or bonus to any of those uh, deputies or executive assistants whose contributions to the state in the preceding year are deemed especially significant. And those special salary increases or bonuses shall not exceed, there's that term again, the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the CBA then in effect. Section three defines that as 4.15% in FY22 only. And then the rest of this in subsection C is just cleaning up some language, the which to that capitalizing governor. We move on to page five, and this is where the bill starts to actually amend statutory salaries. And we start out with our statewide elected officers. So you can see here, this provides our statewide officers with their annual salary. And what is going on here is only providing these officers with an increase for FY22, because remember the suggestion is to only allow exempts and executives, um, executive branch officers to obtain increases in FY22. So for these annual salaries, it's just that 4.15% increase from what they are currently making um, under that middle column. So that was subsection A. Then this subsection B uh, goes into salary increases available to uh, 
department commissioners and agency secretaries and other heads of departments. So this intro language says that the governor may appoint each officer of the executive branch listed in this subsection B at a starting salary ranging from the base salary that's stated that does not exceed the maximum salary unless otherwise authorized. And it goes on to say the maximum salary for each appointed officer shall be 50% 50% above base salary. So as you'll see, as we scroll down, this statute provides what the base salary is for these officers, not their annual salary, not exactly what their salary is, but they're just their base salary. So this language goes on to say that the governor annually may grant to each of those officers an annual, annual salary adjustment subject to the maximum salary. And the annual salary adjustment granted to these officers, there's that term again, shall not exceed the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement in effect. That's the defined phrase in section three to mean 4.15% in FY22. It goes on to say, in addition to that annual salary adjustment that's provided, the governor can also grant to them special salary increases subject to the maximum salary or a bonus if their job duties have changed, significantly increased, their contributions to the state have were deemed especially significant, but those specially, special salary increases or bonuses shall not exceed that defined phrase total rate of adjustment available to classified employees. That's the 4.15% in FY22 only. So then you see the bill goes on to actually list what the base salary is for each of these listed officers. It's the base salary because they can have adjustments on top of that. So what this is doing for the column listed base salary as of July 4, 2021 is providing them with that 4.15% increase um, at the beginning of FY22 only. And thank you to Harold for double checking my numbers here. Um, so you'll just adding that 4.15% to all of these statutory salaries for all of these officers that are listed here. That's yeah, and Jim has a question. Yeah, Betsy Ann, on these uh, exempt salaries, I, I just wanna make sure I understand it. Let's assume you have an exempt position that pays the base salary and statutes $100,000 and that they currently are, it sounds like they can, the governor can increase that by 50%. So the range really is of the position is 100 to 150, is that correct? So that is the, I think that that intro language in B is their starting salary, that the starting salary um, it can, range from the base salary up to the maximum and the maximum is 50% from the base. So okay. that's the starting so, salary. And then there's the adjustments that can be provided on top of that. Okay, so I'm just for my simple math, if it was 100,000, the governor can pay up to 150,000 for that position if the 100 is the base. For their starting okay. salary, yes. Okay, so if uh, this coming year, um, where we're not in this bill changing any of those base salaries. If a commissioner, for example, was making 120,000 for that example, the base is 100, the governor could still give that commissioner a raise. No, um, I don't believe so. I see the commissioner agreeing with me. And that's because this language on page six, starting on line three, says that the annual salary adjustment granted to officers under this section shall not exceed the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the CBA then in effect. And that term is defined to be the 4.15% in FY22 only. Okay. Commissioner, uh, are, is, uh, do you agree with my what I just stated? Okay, I see you're saying yes. Okay, so the governor cannot increase the salary of an exempt employee at all during fiscal year uh, 21? 
None of these employees know. <clears throat> okay. What if what if we the governor had to hire a new commissioner? That commissioner could be hired anywhere between um, the base and 150 percent. So for a for my job, the salary listed here is 104,097. If he hired a new commissioner of human resources, the high that would be the low end of the salary, and the highest end of the salary could be around 150 fifty thousand plus. Most of these salaries are around, um, I would say, around 125 percent of base. Okay, so currently. if you were bringing in somebody new, you could pay more than what the current commissioner. Yes. But the current commissioner cannot get a raise this coming fiscal year then. Is right. that? Yes. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Jim, are you looking for a new job? All no. Right. That's, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So that, that there's those base salaries that are adjusted FY22 with a 4.15% increase. So I'm just gonna scroll through. Um, here, I'll just point out we're at, at, at page eight, line 19. Um, this is just, it seems to be a quirk in the law. Um, you can see it says the secretary of administration may include the director of OPR in any pay plans that are established under the authority of 1020C, which we saw up above in section four. Um, and then it says, provided the minimum hiring rate does not fall below a base salary um, that is of, as of this current fiscal year, you can see the current 80,041. Um, and then adding on the 4.15% in FY22 to read as of July 4, 2021, 83,363. So that's a 4.15% increase for FY22, like all other exempts for the direct, director of OPR. Um, just uh, here on page nine, line 14, just a technical correction. We use shall not instead of may not when we say that something cannot happen. Um, so you can see the current law is that the commissioner of health um, shall not exceed a maximum salary of 150,000, FYI. But that was just a technical correction to the language. Then on page nine, line 16, we get into the judicial statutory salaries. And again, this is only amending them so that they have increases beginning in FY22 with that 4.15% increase. So it starts with the annual salaries, the actual salaries of these listed judicial officers as of the beginning of the first FY22 pay period, adding on to those annual salaries, the 4.15% increase consistent with the other um, statutory officers only getting an increase of 4.15% in FY22. On page 10 in section seven, this provides the daily rate for our assistant judges. And again, it's just an increase in that daily rate beginning in FY22 of that 4.15% increase. Section eight gets into the probate judges, same thing. Annual salary, it would get adjusted uh, in FY22 of that 4.15%. And you can see probate judges have um, different salaries. I believe it was back in uh, the 2011, if I'm correct in my notes. No, it was the 2012 Pay Act. Um, asked for a caseload study for probate judges. And so I think there were some of the tweaks to the salaries there for probate judges that was based on their caseload. And so you'll see differences in their statutory salaries. On page 13 in section nine, we get to the uh, salaries of sheriffs. This is actually the elected 14 
county sheriffs. And so as you've already discussed, um, there's a difference between the Chittenden County Sheriff compared to the other ones. But regardless, it's just that 4.15% increase beginning in FY22. Then we get into the state's attorneys. And again, this means the elected state's attorneys of the 14 counties. And likewise, like everyone else of these statutory salaries, they would get a 4.15% increase at the beginning of FY22. No increase there for FY21. And that's the actual annual salary. All right. Page 14 at the bottom in section 11, we get into amending the legislative pay statutes. There are two of them. Uh, the first one is for the speaker and pro tem because they get an uh, annual salary and in addition, um, the weekly payments. And so the first thing that is happening here is just updating these statutes to reflect what the pay actually will be at the beginning of the 21 biennium, but this is without any compensation increases. If you look at the current law language of what the legislative pay statutes provide, it's the same for the all legislators. You'll see your uh, the non-speaker and pro tem legislative statute is the next one. But you can see right now on page 15, um, starting on line five, that it says that the compensation shall be adjusted annually um, by the cost of living adjustment negotiated for state employees under the most recent collective bargaining agreement. This is where legislators are not on equal footing with the other constitutional officers because other constitutional officers normally get both the COLA, which is the across the board increase, and the step equivalent. Legislators have not been getting that. Um, so every time that there's increases provided for the constitutional officers, legislators are um, losing ground. So this would say instead that, all right, you had take your salary that will exist at the beginning of the 21 biennium. There is no increase provided to it um, because by statute, even though you get what's in the, the COLA that's in the CBA, for FY21, there is no COLA. There's just the lump sum payment. So legislators will not receive an increase for FY21. But this language would change that at the beginning of FY22 with the language that on line four says, provided that beginning on July 1, 2021, beginning of FY22, and annually thereafter on January 1, the annual compensation shall be adjusted consistent with the compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. So this language would put legislators on equal footing if for by chance um, you decide in FY22 not to give the other constitutional officers an increase, this would mean legislators don't get an increase. So you would be on all equal footing. So Betsy Ann, um, for folks who are watching this, um, you know they may not be as familiar with fiscal year versus session and how legislative pay works. So um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay this out as I understand it, and I know you'll correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But uh, a, a potential pay increase in starting in fiscal year 22 means that. Uh, that in the second half of the next biennium, so we're all we're all running for re-election now. The next legislature will come into session for the first year of that biennium. They will get no pay increase because we are because uh, we're not offering the exempts a pay in for fiscal 21. And then for the second year of the next biennium, there would be that small pay increase. Am I am I Correct on that? Yes. 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 And and just for our friends who are following along from home, the legislature only gets paid for the weeks that we are in session. So January through in a typical year, May, but here we are June and, uh, and still plugging along uh, because of all of the COVID response we've had to do. Um, 
So I think what I'd like to do is jump over to Steve Klein right now because he's done a little bit of work on uh, on helping us understand what this actually looks like. So Steve, can you help us? Um, I believe that you created a, a chart. A that chart, that yes. And I, I think it's sent to your website, but um, I, I don't know your committee procedure. You can put it up on the screen or do you tend to prefer to just have people go to your site and look? Um, at, most people have a second device that they're looking at the bill. Okay, line. great. So let me, let me just talk about it for a minute and Betsy Ann can um, uh, chime in if she thinks I got the year wrong. But what happened was up until 2005, there was nothing um, in the statute about legislative pay. So every year when you did a pay act, there'd be this discussion and should we give legislators raises? And the answer was, no, no, we're not gonna take a raise. So then in 2005, there was a study, an outside group came in and looked at legislative pay and made a number of recommendations, some of which were implemented, uh, such as paying you the expense amounts you get, things like that. Um, half of the pay increase was implemented. They just said, we'll give them the COLA, but not the, the step equivalent. And so that was in 2005. What I put up on the web was a five year, look back on just five years, just so you can sort of see how the trend works. And I don't know if people had that in front of them. And what I did is I assumed that you, and because you, I think, as you mentioned, legislators only get paid for 18 weeks. So the dollar figure here is 12 grand or something like that you get a year or whatever the number is, depending on, well, each legislature is a little different and each year is different. But um, but if you take a dollar, you know, and what I did is I took a dollar that a legislator gets and a dollar that the exempts, the treasurer, the auditor, the lieutenant governor, AG and secretary of state get. And then you watch what happens in 2016, and this is rounded, so in to the nearest penny. So everybody got, you got a two and a half percent increase and the, uh, and we, and they got a 3.3% increase. So you ended up right now, it's 103, 103. The next year, a 2% increase and a 3.7, which brought it to 105, 107, and then 2.25, 395. And you can see how it's happening here, 1.35 and 269. And by the time you get to 2020, it's a dollar 10, the legislative $1 is going to a dollar 10. The, uh, the exempts and all the all the other constitutional officers is growing to 117 for each each hour each dollar you earn and so if you take that back 10 more years it gets quite a big number but what i the reason i didn't go back 10 years is because there's lots of intervening insanity that goes on like one year there was a five percent cut and legislators had more of a cut than other people did um, because you were very magnanimous about what you were going to get paid and there's all types of changes that occur but the concept is here that we sort of institutionalize something that will constantly reduce your relative pay compared to the other constitutional officers. So as I understand this proposal, it just says whatever constitutional officers get, you will be tied for that amount. And so for the example you're using, let's say next year they get nothing because you end up giving them nothing down, um, because you, you, if you add that language and next year comes around and the, uh, it's a terrible year and you, you want to do it, then we, you would track them. This language just says, track what you do for other constitutional officers, as I understand the, the concept. So that's sort of the, the history in a nutshell. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Mike Merwicki's raising his hand. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I hope this is a, a good time to, to share a little bit about um, what happens with the, the low rate of pay we get. Um, my district mate will be leaving after one term. Uh, we talk about wanting to bring younger people to Vermont, younger people to the legislature. And here we are, a dedicated 30-year-old who really enjoys and is doing some good work here in the legislature, and he just can't afford to do it. He's the father of a young child. Um, he's looking to get married again and start another addition to his family and he just can't do it on what we get paid as legislators and i know there's a lot of talk about what what we do and what we don't get and I, i'm sure we've all heard from constituents saying i want your salary and benefits and i say no you don't <laughs> 
but I, I hope we can continue to look at this. And I, and I know we're in a, a tough situation that's going to get tougher looking ahead. But most especially as we look to the future, to people like Representative Hashim, uh, if we're going to keep people like this, uh, we, we need to make sure they can at least pay their bills with what we get here. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, along the, I've got another committee member who wants to ask a question, but kind of along those lines, I recall when I was first elected, um, I was probably 34 or 35 when, uh, when I, was, I was walking through the House chamber when most committees were in session and there was a tour group going on. And, and one of the tour guides was explaining to this group of school students that um, most people who served in this grand body, in this grand room, are either retired or independently wealthy because those are the only <laughs> afford to serve in uh, because of the, the pay being only for the few months of the year that we're working and, uh, and no, no salary the rest of the year and the difficulty of patching together, um, uh, you know, supporting a family on that kind of a, a salary. And I, I remember feeling kind of frustrated because at that moment, you know, I was thinking, boy, it would be great if the House of Representatives had more uh, young parents with children in school kind of dealing with the normal challenges of, of life in Vermont, um, serving in our legislature and expressing uh, the, the needs and the concerns and the desires of, of people with young children. So I, my heart really goes out to Representative Hashim because I have really enjoyed his perspective um, his life experiences uh, and his uh, and his place in life in his life pa path um, have been really valuable uh, in informing his legislative work. So it's sad to see that uh, that he has to move on to find uh, find employment that gives him a more consistent um, and higher salary. Uh, Jim Harrison, you've had your hand up. Uh, my apologies for making you wait. No, not at all. I. Um have my hand up a lot, uh, Madam Chair. So, um, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate, first of all, your comments and I appreciate the comments of uh, the member from Putney. Um, but I wanna go back to Betsy Ann in this subject. Um, where, I mean, I, I and I, again, this is only my second pay act, but you know, we do the COLA plus the step. Where is it written that we have to do both each year? It's not written that you have to do both each year for the constitutional officers and the exempts. It's a policy decision each time. Um, so as I had put in the pay act summary when we first started to discuss this, the General Assembly usually provides the same increases to exempts and statutory officers that are that are provided to um, the employees covered by CBA, but you don't have to. Um, but it is has been standard practice in normal fiscal years to do so. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. I guess I come at this, we should decide what the appropriate base salaries, and we can certainly have a good discussion about legislative base pay for some of the reasons that were just mentioned. And we should have a discussion about what the governor's salary should be, what the secretary of state salary, what the sheriff's salary, et cetera. But once you establish that, given something unusual, then they should be adjusted by COLA. And I, I just never understood step increases are for experience, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years on the job. Um, but uh, you, you could get elected governor this November and be one year on the job or no years on the job and you would get a step increase. And it just never made sense to me. And it's just something, maybe we can't fix it all here, but we should consider that. Um, additionally, on this line, 
what happens if there are some elected officials that we go beyond step increases or COLA because we learn that they're out of sync for the job? What happens then? Do we average them? In other words, let's just say we increased the governor's salary by 50%. I don't think we're going to, but if we did, what, what would that mean? Would legislators get a 50% increase? I don't think so. Um, if, if there were some sort of tweak to the other constitutional officers' statutory salaries, and that became a question, you know, if, for example, if you decided to do uh, extra increase for the governor, um, that, that might be a chance to define what compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers means, similar to what how that section three operates. If just if there is a question about, well, one constitutional officer got this increase, but the other constitutional officers got this increase. So I think that would be an opportunity to define this phrase here on page 15, line eight and the other places just for clarity purposes. Okay, thank you. Steve Klein, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I think that's, I would agree with Betsy Ann. It's actually an interesting point that we need to probably think about it. The intent clearly wasn't to do that, to have it go up by anything other than just to reflect what happens in the, the Pay Act equivalent. Um, so I think we, Betsy Ann could look at that language and see if there's something we need to do. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about the, um, uh, and that this is obviously an interesting point you're raising about the COLA and the um, treatment of the, um, the steps. For all exempt employees uh, who don't have steps, there's no sort of automatic increase. They do build in a step equivalent, and it's about 1.9%. The way it works with the classified employees is they get more than that in the early years and then they get later and less than that in the later years so it's actually um, over the initial years the 1.9 sort of understates what what people are receiving and uh, when you get to be 15 or 20 years in you probably uh, classified people don't get raises every year for a step so it's a, it's a fair question and we we didn't get into that issue I think if you end up deciding down the road that all all uh, constitutional officers should not get the uh, step increase. The way this is drafted and the concept here is the legislators would not get it either. It's just sort of a, it's a this is a, para, a concept of having their pay be parallel to other constitutional officers, whatever you decide down the road. Marcia Gardner has a question. Uh, just something I'd like to add and um, the Commissioner of Human Resources can correct me if I'm wrong, but. I believe that when classified employees receive a step increase, they're normally reviewed also at that time. And their um, supervisor does not necessarily have to approve the entire step increase or one at all. Um, so in a sense, it is a way to make sure that people are reviewed on a regular basis. Uh, but like I said, Beth can correct me if I'm uh, not correct on this. Thank you. Go ahead, Beth. Um, I'm going to talk and then I'm going to ask the Director of Labor Relations to correct me if I am wrong. But I believe the only time you wouldn't give a classified employee their step increase was if their performance was unsatisfactory. That's correct. And step increases are not necessarily tied to a uh, length, length of service or the service date or the annual review date because they can change when people change jobs. Whereas our uh, classified service review dates don't change if you maintain continuous employment. And the, but and for the most part, employees do get their steps of year. The vast majority of our, of our employees are are performing in a satisfactory or above manner. I think Bob Hooper has his hand up. Well, but you are supposed to be reviewed annually, so there is that opportunity. Whether it happens or not is a whole nother ball of wax. But 
Correct, but it's not tied necessarily to right. somebody somebody's step date or receiving a step date. Yeah. Any other questions along this line? All right, back to Betsy Ann for language. All right, so we were on page 15. The subsection A was in regard to the annual salary of the speaker and pro tem. Um, then you see on page 15, starting on line 11, that they also get uh, their weekly uh, salary and same concept that's going on here. It would show exactly what that salary would be at the beginning of the 21 biennium, um, but that does not include any increases from what they're making now, just updating the statutory figures, but then providing that that weekly salary um, would get adjusted at the beginning of the FY22 fiscal year, um, consistent with the compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. Then we move over to page 16 and section 12, and this amends the statute governing the pay for all other legislators, and it's the same concept going on here. Providing on line 12 what the pay will actually be at the start of the 21 biennium without any compensation increases, but saying that the beginning of the FY22 fiscal year um, and annually thereafter on January 1, that weekly compensation for legislators would be adjusted consistent with compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. Then we get to page 17 and look at those pay act appropriations. You've already heard some testimony on that um, from our fiscal uh, officers, but it starts out with the executive branch. And so this language is saying that the two year agreements between the state and the VSEA, and then it lists the bargaining units. Um, so for the Defender General, non-management, supervisory, and corrections bargaining units. And then we added language here, and for the purpose of appropriation, the state's attorney's office's bargaining unit. Um, and that was from speaking with John, to, who described how the state's attorney's office employees are not technically executive branch, but their, their appropriation amounts are included in this executive branch appropriation section. So. Big picture though, it's fully funding all of those collective bargaining agreements for that two year period. Um, also including the collective bargaining agreement with the Troopers Association for that two year period. And then it goes on to say on line 12, and salary increases for employees in the executive branch not covered by CBA are funded as follows. Um, since the non CBA employees would get an increase in FY22. So this is saying in FY21, there's that amount appropriated from the general fund. It's 11,234,950. Um, from the general fund to the secretary of administration for distribution to departments to fund the FY21 collective bargaining agreements and the requirements of this act. Um, there's the amount coming from the transportation fund, the 3,868,451 from the T fund to the secretary of administration um, to go to AOT and DPS um, for to fund the increases for FY21. And then there's the other fund language on um, the 14 million 17,000 from special fund, federal fund and other sources. And then there's language on line nine about the um, ability for other funds in fiscal year 21, the Secretary of Administration can transfer from various appropriations and funds and from receipts of the Liquor Control Board, the sums the Secretary determines to be necessary to carry out the purposes of the act of funding the collective bargaining agreements. Um, this is standard pay act language, um, each of these subdivisions A through D about the sources of these funds. Uh, same thing going on for FY22. This would fund not only the CBAs, but also the exempts and statutory officers increases for the executive branch. Um, there's that 13,686,924 from the general fund um, to the Secretary of Administration for fiscal year 22. From the T fund, 4,764,116. And from other funds, estimated amounts on page 19, line seven, are 
fifteen million eight hundred seventy eight hundred seventy thousand one hundred seventy. And there's again that transfer language. Um, then on line fifteen, there's a that language. This section shall include sufficient funding to ensure administration of exempt pay plans authorized under 10, 32 VSA 1020C. That's the statute that's set forth up above in section four of the act, I believe. Um, and that would include, a, there's that one-off oddity of the director of OPR being included in there, um, but that's just um, language to support those pay raises. For the judicial branch, this is allowing the Chief Justice to extend the judiciary's CBA provisions to judiciary employees who are not covered by it, um, but then it provides the appropriations to do so. Um, on page 20 at the top, it's saying that the two-year agreements for the collective bargaining agreements for the two fiscal years and the salary increases for judicial branch employees not covered by CBA um, are covered as follows for the two fiscal years for FY21, 872,330 from the general fund to the judiciary. And in FY22, it's the uh, 1,258,759 from general fund. And then legislative branch, Steve and Stephanie already addressed um, the 241,000 from general fund and legislative branch for 21 and then the 397,000 from general fund to legislative branch for FY22. And that would include um, the new legislative pay adjustment that's anticipated. And the effective date um, would be July 1, 2020, um, except that the two legislative pay statutes take effect on January 1, 21, because it shows what the salaries will be at the beginning of the 21 biennium. But remember, within the actual statute of, for those legislative pay statutes, it says specifically um, what your pay actually will be in January of 21. That doesn't have an, any sort of increase. But then in July of that year, the beginning of FY22, you would get compensation increases consistent with other constitutional officers. That's it, Madam Chair. I'm, I need to come back with you with that session law section regarding the ability of the legislature to further revise the uh, non-CBA funds if as necessary, depending on the fiscal outlook. And I'll come up with some language, uh, hopefully to meet the uh, committee's intent on that. Great, your, uh, your pacing is impeccable. It is 12.30 on the dot. Um, Bob Hooper has a question. Uh, less a question than a point of curiosity. On page 16 in the subsection 1052, where they refer to um, expenses, um, is 1052 a reference back to uh, administrative bulletin 2.4 or something like that? Or uh, Nope. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 go ahead. You can see 1052 right below there. So what you're looking at on page... Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, no problem. on page 16, what you're looking at there is the salaries for the speaker and pro tem. And so what that uh, language is saying that in addition to their salaries, the speaker and pro tem can get mileage, meals and lodging expenses provided to the other members of the General Assembly under section uh, 2052B. Um, and then you can actually take a look down at 1052B have I shown the language? Oh, sorry, it's it's blanked out by those three asterisks on page 17, line three, but that shows the um, well, allowance. Let me, let me inter interrupt you then. Uh, <laughs> what's the guideline for setting reasonable expenses for the legislature? I mean, what do we shadow something by statute or we shadow something by choice? Oopsie, let me see if I have the authority quickly to share screen. Oh, I don't have share screen authority That's right okay. Here. Send me an email. So yeah, I can send it to you. Uh, okay. uh, it just provides um, in statute your mileage reimbursement and that mileage reimbursement is at the rate per mile determined by the federal office of government wide policy published okay. in the federal register. GSA, you right? are able to get your meals and lodging allowance. And the, that's you're used to all these expenses if you um, you know, getting, getting your meal and lodging allowances here through 
uh, with your normal expense uh, expense expenses that you get for your legislative service. Thank you. John Gammon has a question. Thank you. Um, following up on Representative Hooper's question some way, um, uh, would this be an opportunity to clear up the language around expenses and um, that you actually have to drive your own car to get the mileage? <laughs> yeah. um, that is a policy decision. Actually, Andrea gave me share screen so I can just show you if you want real quick. There's this statute. Um, so this is the legislative pay statute for the legislators aside from speaker and pro tem. Um, this subsection B is in regard to the expenses you can receive. And it's interesting, um, there's the mileage reimbursement in B1, and then there's the meals and lodging allowance, different term. Um, so if you wanted to pursue that, you could do that here. Um, that's a policy decision for you to make, whether you want to address that in the Pay Act. Thank you. That's definitely a, a, a good section of the statute to call our attention to, John, because I've always been troubled by the fact that that seems to uh, that seems to encourage more people to drive to the state house in their own vehicle as opposed to carpooling or taking public transit where they have uh, access to it. Um, thank you, Betsy Ann, for that committee. Any other questions for Betsy Ann before we uh, finish this topic? Okay, so I will, um, I will put a very specific ask out to committee members, which is to please contact me um, between now and the end of the day tomorrow and let me know who else you would like to have back in front of the committee with respect to the Pay Act. Um, if there are other perspectives that you believe we need to hear from, if there are previous witnesses who you have um, additional questions for, if there are people you would like to have present when we come back uh, in, into committee and have committee discussion about the Pay Act, um, we, I want to make sure that, um, that we invite them. This is not, um, you know, it's not as simple as if we were in person at the State House where we could simply take a five minute break and walk down to the cafeteria and find Commissioner Fastigi and ask her to come and join us. So we need to be a little more intentional with this. Um, and my goal will be to, uh, to have the folks that we need uh, invited by Zoom so that they can be with us for our next, uh, next committee discussion on this, which I expect will be on Tuesday. Um, so um, uh, Andrea and I need to build that, um, that agenda. And then of course, Andrea needs to send out invitations. So I'm gonna rely on committee members to tell me who you feel you need to have a part of the next committee discussion. Does that make sense to folks? Great. Um, so that, uh, that I believe ends our conversation about Pay Act, but there's one other um, uh, thing that I wanted to talk about. Well, two other things I wanted to talk about. Um, one is that we have added an additional committee time this week because uh, the Senate has sent us a bill on, um, on elections. The bill that they're sending us um, uh, resolves the, the issue that uh, was created when we asked the governor to, uh, to give approval to the Secretary of State for, uh, for election uh, adjustments and election planning. Governor doesn't care to be um, required to give his approval on that, and the Senate is sending us a bill that uh, that takes the governor out of that. So we will be um, taking that up in committee tomorrow morning at 8.30. So I apologize for the off-cycle um, committee time and uh, really ask you to do everything you can to be with us tomorrow morning from 8.30 till about 10.00. Uh, so that we can look at, I think it's Senate Bill 348. Is that correct, Betsy Ann? Okay. 
So Betsy Ann can help us take a peek at what the Senate has done. Uh, we'll hear a couple of different perspectives on that um, so that we can be ready to move that along. Uh, this is something that is uh, of a timely nature. Uh, Bob Hooper has a question. M Madam Chair, can we vote by absentee on that? That's <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Um, so <laughs> The only way we can do that is if I get to sign your cast. <laughs> so uh, Representative Hooper let me know that he, uh, he has a little doctor's appointment that he needs to go to tomorrow morning. So he, he may only be able to uh, listen in for parts of what we're doing tomorrow, if at all. So um, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get you in on what we're doing, Bob. You know, yeah. earbuds earbuds and zoom by cell phone is how I've taken quite a few meetings in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, the last thing that I want to say to the committee um, is I want to give you a heads up about uh, a memo that the speaker sent to all committee chairs and vice chairs and this is related to COVID relief fund appropriations. Um, the, the speaker and the pro tem uh, really feel strongly that, that we should be looking at the COVID relief fund money that has come from the federal government in, um, in a couple of different buckets. Um, and that our goal should be to, to try to prioritize what are immediate COVID relief um, uh, projects that we can get money out into Vermonters' hands, uh, getting Vermonters back to work, uh, filling holes that are created by COVID, um, responding to this emergency in the short term, and that we should aim to be getting that money out uh, ASAP. And I believe, um, John Gannon, you can correct me if you know differently, I believe that the Appropriations Committee is hoping to hear back from committees by next Wednesday for that sort of short term. Yeah, okay. Alexa is nodding yes. So, <laughs> so next Wednesday, the Appropriations Committee would like to hear from committees about what I think are sort of the first round, how do we get relief out into the hands of Vermonters and out into our communities ASAP. Um, the second the second bucket though, um, the speaker and the pro tem feel it's wise for us to take a deep breath and a pause and also uh, to wait and see if there's any change in, um, in the restrictions that the federal government has put on that COVID relief money. Because as you know, right now, the money is not supposed to be used to, to backfill lost revenue due to COVID. Um, so, for instance, you know, rooms and meals tax went through the toilet and sales tax, likewise. Uh, we can't take COVID relief money um, and use it to plug in uh, lost revenue right now. But there's a possibility that, you know, over the course of the next several months, as most states in our country are looking at, at massive losses in revenue, there's a possibility that we will be uh, given some more flexibility in being able to use that to backfill um, lost revenue. And so the idea is that we will divide the COVID relief fund money into two pots, one that we aim to get out quickly right now, uh, get in the hands of Vermonters uh, and, and, and get it helping right now, and that we'll hold on to some uh, more of that money for our August, September timeframe um, to see whether there are uh, other flexibilities that are granted in how we will uh, pay for that or how we will use that money. Um, John or uh, anyone else uh, have anything to add to that or do you have any questions for me about the framing of that? All right, nobody's diving for their... Um, for their button. Um, so the, the speaker has given us, uh, each of the committees, um, sort of a, a, a ballpark um, in terms of what she would like us to be thinking about. And for most committees, the or for many committees, I should say, the, the pots of money are larger on the front end to, you know, let's get 
let's get money out into our communities and, and out helping Vermonters right away. But for us, because our committee has, uh, has a kind of a different jurisdiction, uh, she's actually given us sort of the, the okay to think bigger for that second pot of money than for that first pot of money. So the targets that she's asked us to look at would be, you know, are there, are there $10 million of, uh, of projects that we could see in the short term and, and, and are there 50 million dollars worth of investments that we could see for the, the longer term. So maybe, um, you know, thinking about the, the longer term projects that, uh, that, that may have been on our minds um, that we could think about funding later on. So I know that this is all a little bit um, last minute and short, uh, short time frame, but I want to throw out to the committee this concept that we uh, we can be thinking of uh, ways of offering relief to our communities um, in the near term and in the in the longer term. Uh, Jim Harrison. Yeah, I just want to raise a question relating to this, and just tell me if I'm on the wrong path or the right path. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that this would be a priority, but Obviously, one of the things we've learned with COVID and um, the isolation and stay home um, were the issue of public records at um, town halls. And many had to do it by, one of the things we worked on last year, for example, was trying to provide some help with the fees to getting them electronic. And I think we'd probably most agree that in an ideal world, all those records would be electronic and available online. Um, could, if we chose, allocate some money to um, help with that effort? And, and again, I'm not, I'm just asking, is that the type of project that would be applicable if we wanted to go down that path? Um, I, in my mind, um, you're, you're on the right path. Um, you know, I don't know the the scope of that project and and what that entails. I know that um, our, the state archivist uh, has been uh, convening a working group who have been thinking about those things and uh, would welcome you to reach out and get some more information about that and see if that's something. I, to me, that's probably something that uh, that is that doesn't fall into the first bucket of like this is stuff that we want to get out into the community immediately um, yeah. but might fall into that longer term okay you know let's plan this out yeah and, and, and I'm not even <laughs> suggesting it would be the priority right now um, all I'm trying to ask is a for an example would that be the type of thing that we might look at yeah right. you know thank you I, I know that the the Judiciary in general has been uh, has been embarking in a process of um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how the terminology works, but uh, a, some form of electronic filing of motions and and actions and things. And uh, you know, it has occurred to me that we should check in with the judiciary committee as well as with the judiciary to see if there is. Uh, if there are lessons learned from the uh, stay home, stay safe order that would um, enable them to invest in uh, mm -hmm. in ways of um, ways of being able to continue to do their work um, in an electronic fashion to the greatest extent possible. Um, we also heard from the commissioner of public safety earlier on in session about a. Um, uh, the the electronic ticketing system that they're talking about wanting to deploy for both the state police and for all of our local law enforcement agencies and maybe that's an investment that uh, that would make sense so at any rate we're uh, we're given freedom to, um, to to think a little bit about that and uh, so I would welcome you to to mull over uh, short-term, Let's get money out into our communities, investments, and longer-term 
uh, COVID response lessons um, that we might want to make a recommendation on. So any other questions from committee? Sorry to go a little bit over. I know some of you are needing to get going on to other, other things. All right, thank you so much for, uh, for staying for an extra uh, 15 minutes or so. And um, I look forward to seeing you all at our, uh, at our meeting tomorrow morning.